Good morning. Um, my name is Diana Dorita. I am of table. Do we have table numbers? I'm at that table. And so, um, good morning again. Um, it's really a privilege to be able to stand up here with a friend of mine. Um, Kathy Ostrowski, our speaker, um, has some titles on that slide. One's missing his friend. Great friend. Great, great, I mean, that just is an understatement. Um, so excited she's here to speak about her journey with our Lord. Um, it's captivating. Um, I think each one of us will be touched um, by her journey it's connected as, as it continues. Um, so I'll let her speak, but why not let's start in prayer. First, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Sweet Jesus, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your sacrifice and for saving each one of us. In this holy week, we honor you as you, we walk with you in your passion. Blessed Mother, please wrap your mantle of protection around our dear Kathy as she shares with us her journey with your Son, our Lord, Jesus Christ. In his holy name, amen. amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And without further ado, my good friend, Kathy Ostrowski. Thank you, Diana. You are a good friend, and I appreciate you so much. I appreciate you, Mary. I appreciate the people that I have met in this community who have been part of my own, what I call widow walk, connecting me to other people. And I think part of God's plan for me to live the rest of my life maybe with a purpose. So I want to uh, just start by saying um, I've never s spoke. I've spoken a lot at U of M in like administrative meetings but I've not spoken to a crowd of this size over something personal like this. But I, I'm, I'm so pleased to do it because I've been dreaming of sharing sort of my story. And I think it's a story, we all have a story. Every one of you have something that you could do to present up here. I hope that you um, learn something from mine. Um, and I hope, I, I don't know, I just hope that this, um, inspires you in some way to think about your story because you're at a Bible study which means you're already you're already believers you're already practitioners and I know that once we start believing and practicing God has intention for us to do something so I want to tell you a story about the love of my life Robbie Ostrowski all right and I and before I tell you that story I want to kind of give you a context of some of the things um, that I want you to draw because we're going to be a little bit speed dating. Like I have five slides, but I could actually spend hours on little subtopics and the miracles that the Lord brought into my life with my, the love of my life. Um, each. Like each of these little, little issues has prongs, has a tributary, and I could go down it. So forgive me, because I'm probably going to talk fast through some of this. I wanted to share it a little bit through pictures, because I want you to capture some of the essence of the good times and the bad times. I'm going to try to talk about the miracles. And I want to I try to talk about how really God showed me, not just as a believer, but that he has the plan, not me, that he has the journey for me, and he will show up especially if you're praying and especially if you do it in times like Eucharistic ad adoration. So I, I literally developed this from 4.30 this morning to like 6.30 this morning. And, I, and uh, you'll see that Kathy Loves Robbie is in 1970s modern. And there's a reason for that. And we'll start right away with it. There's Robbie and there's Kathy. Uh, summer of 1980, we met, and I should tell you I'm a Belle villain, born and bred, which means that I might be of a little, I might have been curated in a little bit of a different socioeconomic strata than some of you. You know, I grew up in the hood. Uh, Rob grew up in the country. We both grew up poor, right? We met at Driver's Ed in the ninth grade, and he came up to me, I saw him across the room and I said, that is a fine foxy man. <laughs> and he was foxy. And he came up to me and he said, 
you're the worst driver in the world. <laughs> and I said, you're mine. I was kind of a popular girl back then. You can see I was a looker back then. Uh, but he was even a better looker. That picture was taken on July 4th, 1980. The, the ten, our 10th grade year, we had gone, been going together for three or four months. I'm not gonna share why this picture is so special to me, but I'm gonna kind of give you a hint because it plays to the brokenness and some of the challenges of our marriage and our life together. Uh, it was July 4th. Some people get a bang out of July 4th. And we were first lovers that day. All right? T way too early to be first lovers in God's eyes. We did not do that right. So that's the first dysfunction I want to share with you. But I'm, he meant everything to me. I was obsessed with him. He meant, I, I lived and breathed just to be around him every day. We talked for hours. We were pretty much inseparable. We were the class couple, Belleville High School, class of 83. He was the class troublemaker. He was the class cr clown. I was the captain of the cheerleading squad. But as our relationship became serious at way too young of an age, um, I became nervous. You know, that will happen when a young girl is doing stuff she shouldn't be doing. And um, when I became nervous, I became ultra possessive. And it caused turbulence in our relationship, and we struggled. And we broke up. Um, we broke up when he surprised. I went off to college. He tried it, didn't do well. Um, and he, he declared to me that he was going into the Marine Corps four years later. So we were together for four years. But there was turbulence from the time we became serious, even though I loved him like nobody's business. He ended up marrying someone in the Marine Corps for a year. And uh, her name was Kathy, too. And then they divorced after a year, and they were kids. And that came into play, too, as I share with you our journey in Catholicism. There we are, back together again. 1987, love refound. He had divorced after a year, and I was engaged to a dentist. I was about to get my degree, and he came up at our around he sent me a postcard for our five-year reunion and it said I thought you were married period and I, that's that's relevant to someone like me a word person because it was sort of emblematic of our relationship he uh, didn't go so far as to say I love you I miss you he didn't say a question like please answer because I want to talk to you he put period, which is the way dudes work when they want to preserve all their pride and dignity and stay in control, right? But I knew that he wanted to see me, and we saw each other. Uh, one of our friends surprised us by having us show up at the same place, and the very next day, um, I broke up with the dentist. And then we were married the following uh, year. So here we are, happier, back together different though because nervous unsettled Kathy had an education he was newly uh, divested of the Marine Corps and I don't know how many of you know Marines uh, but they have their own control challenges but Kathy confidence had sort of sprung and so even though we were so pleased to be back together our relationship was passionate but somewhat, vol not volatile, we never hit each other, but sassy, all right? And that can't, comes into play when I wanna talk a little bit about our brokenness. All right, um, I don't have a photo for this set of years, and the reason I don't, and I should, because there are probably five photos that I'd love to share with you. One is our wedding, which is just a cool photo. But others are just how we changed over time um, as we were uh, navigating married life together with kids and the strain of it and growing up poor and trying to earn money and dealing with the pressures of life. And I'm going to tell you, maybe it's good that we did not have photos because this was a period, a long, long period, a long, long period of 
turbulent ups and downs. All right, we had three children, Claire, she's now like 33 and a lawyer, Chris, 1994, and he, I live with him because I'm building a widow house next door. Small house, big pool, grandbaby pool. And then Connor, 2001, and he is just graduated from college. Um, we, again, a couple that did not, that struggled to relate well because we both had become selfish and we certainly didn't know anything about the word other-centered. Uh, we were both struggling just to make ends meet and I had dreams for the kids that he thought were unnecessary. He came from, of course you don't pay attention to any of this stuff when you're young, but he came from an alcoholic family, right? So beer was part of the nomenclature of our very big, um, Poli on his side, Polish Catholic family. Uh, it wasn't so much mine, uh, Southern Baptist, uh, and, and I was a Southern Baptist and then Lutheran. Um, but uh, we just argued a lot. Our kids saw that. They saw sort of misery. And I think that's important to share because if you look at the statistics now of our children, many of them have elected not to get married weird because marriage really is sort of the baseline for stability even if you're not religious and building a life together but it's so important if you're religious because it is honestly the 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 we know this as catholics marriage is special to the lord because he uses it as the symbol of his god on earth as his love for us right and, and one of the things I want you to draw from some of the things I share about the turbulent times is, obviously, if uh, um, marriage has been that sort of symbol um, uh, in the Bible and in salvation history um, and the way Jesus loves us, there's suffering there. But no one told us that. No one told us, hey, uh, suffering and, and turmoil and challenges and, and, and I remember reading the story in the Bible about turning the other cheek and I, having been raised Southern Baptist I'm pretty Bible fluent I knew all the stories from a very young age but I remember reading it and thinking I'll tell you what I don't think I, I don't really understand turning the other cheek that seems unjust to me but I think it's important to, to talk about some of the phenomena of today's marriages and that issue of other-centeredness. It, it, it manifests itself in the form of sort of, and I'm just going to talk about random examples, men always going golfing, fantasy football, bowling, um, shopping, you know, just every, any kind of way that you distract yourself in trying to carry forward during really struggling times when you're not thinking about we've got to figure this out together because we have a family unit. Now that, that happens way less in a religious community, especially a Catholic community because we understand marriage and God's plan for us. But it still happens, right? So during this time, we nearly divorced once. We nearly divorced because he... Um, we went off to our one and only vacation to meet, see my sister get married in Las Vegas. And um, uh, when we were gone, my brother-in-law um, sort, of, sort of laid his hands on my child. And Rob didn't deal with it. And I was mad. Um, he did, Rob didn't let me divorce. He ended up begging me back to, to that. And it was a little bit of a game changer for us because up to that time he was pretty much in control and, and, and made it clear that he knew he was not real satisfied with me. At that time I had sort of gained weight. He liked the way I looked in high school. Um, I think my uh, extroversion was not really key for him a Marine. He liked more the reliant Kathy from high school. You know? But... He didn't want to divorce me. And I want to say one thing about even dysfunctional marriages, say from the hood. Uh, one thing that he and I both had in common was that we came from uh, sort of broken families 
that stayed married. So we had a little bit of a resilience uh, gene, and thank God for that. Thank God for that. I will tell you that um, for some of the things that he told me about myself when he was mad at me, and I'm not going to go too much into it, but you could imagine some of the things he said to me. I might say a little bit. Um, like most people would say, get rid of that guy. By then, I had a good job at the University of Michigan. I've worked there for 34 years. I'm an administrator. By then, I was probably could have handled myself. But most people would have said, get rid of that guy. But we both had a gene that said, stay together, even though it was not ideal, and probably put a lot of nervousness into our children. They tell me now we were always afraid when he walked into the room, not because he was going to hurt them, because it took the tone of happiness level way down, way down. He has his story about the way I was, because I, was, I had something to say about everything. I wish you were here, because it is important to know that things are balanced. I read in a psychology book when I was considering getting rid of him uh, that psychiatrists, actually, that are seasoned will tell you that water always seeks its own level. In other words, if something bad's going down in your life, you probably are an equal participant in that. And let me tell you, Sassy Kathy was. Right. All right. Um, I can tell you how I felt. I was alone a lot. I, at that time, my career was going pretty well, and honestly, the only reason I had a career was because he was tight, and I wanted things for my kids. So I moved up every time I needed money to do what I wanted for my kids. I took them to church. I actually took them to church here. I can tell you emphatically, you know, a lot of times women, we have envy and sort of we think about, I want that. I never really envied anyone's material possessions. Um, I did sort of envy skinnier women, um, but not really. I envied every woman that showed up at this church because I, we I was going to this church at that time with a husband because I was taking my kids to church my whole life alone. And I couldn't, I just prayed for that. Why can't my husband just go to church with me? Uh, honestly, we ended up sort of, at that point, living largely separate lives. How did we cope with the stress? I mean, I wanna say this, it is weird to say we live largely separate lives. We still had passion for each other, right? But it was more of a use you kind of passion like he wasn't satisfying my spiritual or sort of friendship needs, and I know I probably wasn't satisfying him. Um, uh, so how did we cope with the stress? Well, he drank, and I ate, right? Now, he didn't, I didn't think he drank a lot. He told me later, yes, I drank a lot. And, and I'll go to how this all came full circle. I converted to Catholicism at that time, and that's the first of the miracles I want to share with you. I was so invested in my kids, probably over, overly so, in their activities, their athletics. I had kids that played high-end athletics, all of them. And it was largely because of my programming. How many of you are the responsible programmers for your kids' lives? Probably plenty of you, but I program them high-end private lessons, la, 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 la. We were busy all the time, and that was what I sort of lived for. Um, and he didn't participate much in that, even though I had no athletic capability whatsoever, and he was really more the natural athlete. He played baseball in, in high school and was good. But um, I was a little dissatisfied with uh, public schools because I had an ADHD son who was a chip off his dad's block. And, uh, and it was just a struggle to deal with the school system and try to partner with such a large school system here. But FGR wanted him, my son, they pro and I'm gonna admit to you straight, they wanted him to play baseball, right? But what happened, and, and so the day that I was, I told Rabbi, I said, there's this Catholic school, mind you, I'm Lutheran and I want him to go to a Catholic school. And he's like, oh my God. First it's this, then it's that. It's, you know, what is it this time, Kathy? 
I'm like, I think Catholic school be good for them, him. How much? He goes, how much is it? I said, it's 10 grand a year. And he said, no, blah, 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 way. No, no. And I said, I really want to go to Catholic school. And he said, he just said no. And, and this was part of our turbulence because if he said no, I just still did what I wanted. But I, funny thing, that very week, I went into work and even though I am the person who would have determined the wages at that point at the University of Michigan, my boss came in and said, hey, you know that, that compensation analysis you did for me yesterday we talked through? I said, yeah. And he said, how come you're not on it? And I said, well, I was doing it for the rest of the folks. He said, I'm giving you 10 grand. <laughs> Miracle number one. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> All right. So I said that I was too much of a sports mom. But I want to just share you two um, ways that we picked at each other here. Um, one time he came home from bowling. He was with his buddies. And he was agitated, which he was often agitated, and surly, and critical. I'm more sort of the, po like, almost Pollyanna-ish positivity. Opposites do attract. And he said, where were you? And I said, well, I was at practice with all the other dads. <laughs> That's the way I would do it with him. <laughs> right? Um, one time he came home from bowl uh, bowling again, and the kids laugh at this now. And we talk, we kind of laugh at what they call old dad. Now, he came home from bowling, and, and it was a time when we were actually getting along. And, uh, and I was sort of in it with the kids, and he said, what's going on here? And um, I said, well, you know, they're not listening, blah, 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 blah. And he says, he said to the kids, do you realize, do you, any of you realize what we do for you? We do everything for you, everything for you. Like, we give all our money to you. Private lessons, private school. Like, like we don't buy anything for ourselves. You dress well, but look at your mom. Look how she dresses. <laughs> it's like, okay, thanks, Rob. So that's kind of how it went. Interestingly, the career was kind of going well at that point, even though marriage largely wasn't. And a lot of stress at home, a lot of turbulence at home, a lot of arguments at home. And the more I made, the meaner he got. Because he was a man's man. He was a man's man. And I'll talk more about that near the end, too. Okay, I was Catholic at this point. Summer 2014, we're 50 years old. And I want to show this picture for two reasons. Uh, I look at him now at this picture, and I remember, like I look now and I see his red face. What do you reckon that is sort of indicative of? Yeah. Like he's sick. He's sick. He, he's drinking pretty regularly two or three beers a night. I'm eating pretty regularly, <laughs> right? You can see that. I'd been a practicing Catholic for four years, and a couple of things I learned in my newness of Catholicism was a lot about salvation history well beyond the paradigm of a taught fundamentalist, right? Um, I started coming, actually, it was the old OLG school, C school for Eucharistic Adoration, and I went. I was a person who'd get up at four in the morning and do great work for the University of Michigan and pray and go to bed early. But I decided I was going to start praying for my marriage because we weren't going to get a divorce. It just was bad. You know, he treated me poorly, I thought, but actually I didn't treat him with much respect and dignity either. So I went, started going to Eucharistic Adoration at 11 p.m. at night, even though on most nights I'd go at 9 p.m. I'd go to bed at 9. And it was a trial to stay up and go to Eucharistic Adoration. But wild things happened to me there when I was praying. Like one time, one time I was there, and the, there was a picture of Jesus there. And I think it's done. It's one of the pictures of Jesus that's by a, an artist by the name of Finelli. Some of you may know it. 
and his picture ch started changing right before my eyes and it was showing sort of Jesus with different expressions on his face and uh, and he was saying to me chill out I love you and I kind of started crying because I was like Jesus loves me you know and it gave me strength and it bolstered me as sort of an isolated, sort of destitute, married woman who didn't feel real good about herself because she didn't think her husband loved her, you know? Uh, but honestly, the more I became a calmer, sort of at least wrapped in the love of Jesus, Rob became more surly and angry. And um, I remember one time I was doing a rosary in the morning and he was going to work, and uh, I said, uh, he said, he said, while you're there praying to God, why don't you pray that he'll teach you how to cook some bump a bump of food? And he walked out the door and slammed it. Um, but on the rare times that we were together, some weird stuff started happening. Uh, we went to this car dealership because we were thinking about buying a new car and uh, There was this guy who was supposed to be selling a car. He starts talking to Rob about God and Catholicism We walk out of there and he hands him one of the pamphlets that you all have out there and Rob says do you think that was like do you think that was? Just a coincidence and I said absolutely not and he said, why don't you? And I said, well, you know what I pray for at 11 p.m. every Monday night. So he knew that I was praying for our marriage. Uh, it was kind of a weird just juxtaposition between um, just hatefulness and God dealing with him. God was dealing with him because of my prayers, I think. And, and also people who knew about my situation were probably praying for me. At that time, I got the worst and best job of my life. I was the chief department administrator for biomedical engineering at the University of Michigan. And it was a very substantial job. Um, there are only five chief administrators in Michigan medicine representing their either clinical or basic science units. And this one was both for the College of Engineering and Michigan medicine. And I was meant to sort of audit the whole department and restructure it. And it was a kind of a toxic department. I spent three and a half years there, and, and that could be one of those other stories. But literally a month after I took that job, and this is the Lord's miracle again, uh, Rob and I had been fighting. He was staying in his den, his man cave. And uh, I noticed, he, Rob, one thing he was as a sheet metal journeyman was diligent about work. He was never late. And I came down, and he was laying there, and he looked a little shaky. And I said, even though we're fighting, I thought, oh, I'm going to have to talk to him. And I said, what's wrong with you? And he said, I'm sick. And I said, what's, do you want to go to the doctor? And he goes, probably. And I tried to get him to urgent care, and I took off that day, which I had never sacrificed that, being a career woman. It's like, take yourself to the doctor. I take myself to the doctor. Um, but we... We, we ended up taking him to urgent care because the primary care physician wouldn't let us in, and they gave him two painkillers, some antibiotics, um, you know, something to breathe with and something for the fever, and said, you probably have a virus or what have you. And what was weird during that time is, is um, he got marginally better with the fever. He had a high fever, but then it came back. And I am no medical practitioner, but I'm like, that's weird. That's weird. He had high blood pressure, so he, we still weren't able to get into a week later to the primary care physician. So he had a, a random appointment um, for his high blood pressure with his primary. And I said, that's where we're going. And I walked in, and she said, well, you're seeing your blood pressure. I said, no, no, no. And this is where I'm grateful for God in biomedical engineering, being a chief department administrator. I, ha I sort of developed a little bit of chutzpah. I said, no, 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 we're not here for blood pressure. Something is wrong with him, and I want every test you have. Every test you have. 
And she looked at me, and you know now with healthcare the way it is, you know, uh, it's the wrong appointment for the wrong reason. And I could tell in her eyes she was thinking about going toe to toe with me. And thank you, Jesus, she chose not to. And she started ordering tests. And by that night, um, she called us at home and said, we need to order more tests. And, and then we, we knew then something bad is going on. So this is both where horrible things began to happen. We're talking about um, 2016 at this point, and wonderful things begin to happen. First miracle. We go to radiology because he was meant to have ultrasounds and x-rays. And I had sort of a, a woman that worked with me who was a black sort of, like the Lord loved her. She's, she's sort of a, um, what, is the, what is the domination that speaks in tongues? She was a charismatic, but um, Pentecostal woman. And she called me the day we were going to radiology and I said, I, I think Robbie has cancer. And she said, I just found out someone I love has cancer. And we were friends from way back. And um, I said, well, use your red phone, because she was a very, 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 very good prayer. In fact, the director of undergraduate admissions, when we worked together, often had her pray for the football games at Michigan. <laughs> and I said, use your red phone and talk to the Lord about Robbie. And she said, I will. And I said, who, who do you know that's sick? And she said, I can't tell you, I'm not at liberty to say. Well, that night in radiology, I heard her, her, la her son's last name, and I saw that it was his wife. And I went up to them with Rob and I, and I said, do you know Anita Carriage? And they, he said, that's my mom. And I said, she's my good, he said, I know you. And there's a story behind that too, but I don't have time to share it. Um, so the, the wife was also a faithful believer. And we ended up having prayer right there at 9.30 p.m. in the basement of Michigan Medicine. And that was the beginning of my, my husband's 180 degree turn. Now I wanna share with you something interesting about that. Rob was that sort of blue collar acerbic um, quasi racist. Maybe you all grew up with some of that. You, you didn't hate anyone of any other race, but you sure you might say something. And I hated that. That was one of the things I hated him about. Well, from that moment on, it felt like that every time any religious experience happened to us, it was a black couple or a black family. And I think that's really key because the Lord prepares you for meeting you, okay? So I've never really shared that with anyone before, but I, didn't, I don't think it was by accident that it was that particular couple that um, incited a rare, really long and important prayer that changed him that night. If, he, if we were still Baptists, or if I was Baptist, he got saved that night. Okay, there was a moment of conversion. Um, at that moment, I decided, I, I really, it really hit me. I was so mad at him over the way he treated me. But at that moment, I'd, I realized how much I loved him and I, I couldn't even bear the thought of losing him. And my whole priority changed. All of a sudden, he was not second to my kids or other things. He was number one. And I told my boss, I said, listen, my, we did get the diagnosis. We thought it was lymphoma, but it wasn't. It was something called adenocarcinoma of unknown primary. They didn't know where the primary was. But he was stage four right away, right away. I told my boss, and this is where God sent me to biomedical engineering. My boss was the chair, and his wife is a very renowned heart um, breast cancer surgeon at Michigan Medicine. He must have talked about it with his wife. Next day, he came in and he gave me insider information. And he said, Kathy, he said, I'm just gonna tell you this, you do whatever you want with it. He said, uh, for what you got going on, 
um, MD Anderson or Carnegie Mellon's number one, MD Anderson's number two, number three is way down here, way down here, way down here, Kathy. And you're, we're 32 for what you got going on. He said, you need to go to one or two. I said, thank you. And I tried to go to one or two and I didn't have the clout to do it. So I told another faculty member at biomedical engineering she says, I know someone at MD Anderson. And she made a phone call, and we were in the very next week. So the Lord sends you where you need to be for what he knows what you're going through. Biomedical engineering is a weird department because it could be dealing with cells, could be dealing with mechanics. Um, so I, there was a chemical engineer who told me, you better start drinking that alkaline water you sure don't want, you wanna, get, you wanna make sure the pH balance is, makes it difficult for cancer to spread. By the way, you don't want sugar. Cancer loves sugar. So uh, fast food Kathy changed. So did beer drinking Robbie. He quit drinking immediately. Um, geez, there are so many little things so many little secrets that I learned from faculty in biomedical engineering. And I'm just so grateful because it turned out that uh, nine months, and by the way, if a doctor tells you nine months, it's six. It's six. But nine months ended up being three years, and it was just enough for the Lord to fully heal us, to fully heal us. I wish I could tell you all the different ways that he fully healed us. But all of a sudden, Rob was at going to church with me right here, right here. And there are funny stories about that too, but I don't have time. And the kids saw this big, big change. They saw a change of unity and they couldn't believe what they were seeing. In fact, my son said, my older son said, you love dad. I said, I have always loved your dad. He said, I didn't even know. I didn't know you loved dad. Last slide. This MD Anderson thing became every two months, then every month. And I was able, before COVID, to do some work at home in one of the most challenging jobs I ever had while being with him when, wherever we were. And miraculously, whatever they told us to do at MD Anderson was deployed at U of M Hospital. That just doesn't happen because of insurance and other sort of liability issues. So that's another miracle that I didn't even realize was happening. But when we hit Houston, every two months we had a second honeymoon. And here I am, you can see how heavy I am, but look at the lightness on our faces. Like, we were kind of happy to get away. We, we actually started dating again. We conquered Houston, Texas. And let me tell you, on six different occasions, strangers, five out of six being African American, came up and said, can I pray with you? And four of those occasions, we were just out to eat. It had nothing to do with being in the middle of MD Anderson. Everybody in MD Anderson has cancer, okay? So there are a lot of people praying at MD Anderson. Literally every corner was an encounter with the Lord. And we would talk in the hotel room at night about God, and he would say, I don't know how this is going to work. And I'm like, well, we're just going to do it together. And he would say, tell me about this. Tell me about that. I read the Bible to him at MD Anderson in the hotel room. And I have other stories, just so many cool stories and miracles there. I just don't have time. Well, at about, I'm going to say, February of 2019, which was two and a half years in, they put him on a clinical trial, and when they put him on the clinical trial at MD Anderson, we had to get rid of all the supplements that I had insider information to take, and all the, you know, that immune system was, is key, and he went down way quick, way quick, and that's when he knew, I'm, go I'm definitely not going to be healed 
I'm definitely not going to be healed. So I wanted to pass forward to just three days before he, well, a little bit before he died. Three days before he died, I had normally done the nightly prayer, but he said, I want to pray. And he prayed for 10 minutes. But, and I wish I could have recorded that prayer because it was the most humble, accepting prayer of a warrior human you have ever heard. Thanking God for us, for our whole family. Just thanking God that he let us be who we were, that, that we had never broken up. That the Kathy and Robbie of Belleville in the early 80s was together and that he couldn't understand why he was so worthy of the enormous blessings of our life. And I, I remember just having my heart shaking when he's praying, holding my hand, thinking, as a Catholic, I'm going to pray for him every day, but it would be hard-pressed for me to believe that any Savior could not believe of him as being saved right now but for his sheer humility in the 180 degrees that, that he did. The next morning, he said to me, I just want to thank you, my beautiful wife, because you were the best wife. No one could have been a better wife from you. I've loved you forever. And I said, I really didn't think you loved me. I didn't. He said, oh, I always loved you, Kathy. I never didn't love you. He said, but you know, you're a strong woman. You're a strong woman, and you can do a lot of things. And he said, I felt like I couldn't tell you how much I loved you because a girl like you, if, if she knew how badly she, I, she was ra I was wrapped around her finger, that'd be the end of me. That's what he told me. And he said, but I'm just ashamed. All you tried to do for our family and all the things that I thwarted you on, the way I made you feel. And I said, I'm so sorry that I wasn't pretty for you like I was in high school. And he said, you were always beautiful, Kathy. Whether you were fat or skinny, you were always beautiful. There was no one who had a more beautiful heart than you, and I did not deserve you. But I'm just so grateful the Lord gave me you. He told me he was going to die because he saw his father, and his father beckoned to him and said, Yuri, it's going to be okay. And his father had died four months earlier. More story of that, but I don't have time. I just want to say that um, when he died, which is so weird, when he died, I was getting him an extra cold drink, and the hospice nurse had said to him, oh, you could last a month. We were, we were in the, she was laying in the bed in our bedroom. Your vitals are great. And... Uh, after the hospice nurse left, he said, he, I went down to change his beverages, and, and I heard the kids call me up. All my kids were in the room, too, grown. And he, I went up there, and he said, I am dying right now. Hold me up. And the kids held him up. And, and I said... We love you, Robbie. It's going to be okay. And, it, and you know, I don't want to go into the details, but if any of you have seen someone die, it's kind of a startling thing. The kids were freaking out. But we talked to him. And then there was this weird moment where he relaxed, and he sort of reached up. And then he grabbed me, and I'm telling you, this is not an exaggeration. I am so grateful that my kids saw this. The very last cognitive thing my husband did was kiss me on my lips. That was the last thing he ever did. Now, he, he lasted because in sort of the zone stage because we asked him to so his family could get there, and miraculously, they all did. And then his mother said to me, you got to tell him he can go. And when I told him he could go, it was one more breath, and he was gone. So... The other thing I forgot to tell you was, when I asked him, hey, how come you never really wanted to know the Lord or to explore your, your spirituality or understand who God was? And he said, Kathy, I am a stubborn man. It literally took a grave illness for me. 
God knew that that's what it would take for me. That's what I needed. So here I am sharing this, and now we're at the final, final uh, slide. Ever since that experience and how I could see God weaving this relationship from the time we saw each other in driver's ed, it, it really has struck me about this, this supernatural journey, supernatural journey. It's not a natural journey. We're not concocting this ourselves. He has a plan. And if we pray, God's plan prevails. I know this. I know this. Um, and I shared this, at, I actually shared this with Mary and Diana, but I want to share you with you that after Rob died, you know, a lot of people come in and, and will help a widow just to deal with grieving. And I, my daughter, my oldest daughter and my, my sister, we went to New Orleans and we were just spending the night. I was trying to knock out the state of Mississippi. So we we're going to drive to Mississippi the next day because I'm collecting state magnets. And uh, yeah, you know, got to do something. Uh, but we stayed in, you know, uh, downtown New Orleans, right on uh, in, you know, where it's all happening. And uh, my daughter had never had a hurricane. And we weren't about to get drunk or anything. But I said, you can taste a hurricane. So we go into this um, bar. And there's this miserable couple across the room, a very attractive, lean African American couple. And they just were fighting. It was obvious they were fighting. And I said, I'm going to go talk to that couple. And my daughter's like, no, no. <laughs> Why do you got to talk to strangers? It's not your business. It's not your business, Mom. Stay, you know, get, go away from it. I said, no, I'm talking to them. So I went over there, and I said, hey. I said, look at you. You're in this cool town beautiful couple that you are you're so attractive together I said uh, I'm looking at you and I'm thinking oh my gosh my husband died six months ago what I wouldn't give to be in this room right now with him just to be with him just to enjoy a time together I said I hope you guys are enjoying yourself together you never know when you won't be able to see each other again and they were just shocked they were just shocked. So I go sit down, I hang with my kids, and then my daughter's like, do not turn around. Do not turn around. <laughs> but whatever you said, it's working. <laughs> and I did turn around, because I don't listen. And they were holding hands, and you could tell that they were tentatively healing whatever rift they had that day. And then last night when I was thinking, well, what am I going to say to them? And I'm probably gone way over the 30 minutes because I've told you the whole story. But I saw this really awful evangelical Christian movie. Uh, and I don't even remember the name of it, but it had so much going on. I mean, I, I need to tell you the name. I'll get it to you so you can just sort of watch it. It was great with its lesson, but it had like seven subplots going on. <laughs> it was like, but I couldn't stop watching it. And one of it was sort of a profligate male, a womanizer, who learns what real love is. And the, the thing that really struck me as I'm prepping to talk to you all was one of the things he says is, hey, I've learned that your worst mistake becomes your main mission or ministry. If, when your worst mistake becomes your main mission or ministry, God's grace comes full circle. So, I'm on a mission for you all to love your husbands. <laughs> no, no, I don't know about that. I just want to share with you that no matter what you're going through, no matter how destitute it is, um, God can heal it. It's a message of hope. That's what it is. And I don't care how bad it is. I don't know what you're going through. Maybe you're not going through anyone. Maybe you just know someone who's going through something. He can heal it. So I just want to say thank you for letting me share that story. And uh, today, today, do something really special for the one you love. Today. All right. Thank you.